you have your Bibles, go ahead and take them and let's open them to Genesis chapter 27. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 46, and I would invite you to stand for the reading of God's holy word. Genesis 27, verses 1 through 46. Pay careful attention. This is a very messy passage. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare for me delicious food such as I love. And bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went out to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau. Bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord before before I die. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats so that I may prepare them from them delicious food for your father such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go. Bring them to me. So he went and took them and brought them to his mother, and his mother prepared delicious food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And the skins of the young goats she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went into his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I've done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. He said, Are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. Then he said, Bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate, and he brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him, and Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let peoples serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of his fa- Isaac, his father, Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. He also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, 
Who are you? He answered, I'm your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me, and I ate, ate it all before you have come, and I have blessed him? Yes, and he shall be blessed. As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully, and he has taken away your blessing. Esau says, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Then he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him lord over you, and all his brothers I have given to him for servants, and with grain and wine I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall be your dwelling, and away from the dew of heaven on high. But, I, but your, by your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. But the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to Laban, my brother in Haran, and stay with him a while until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns from, away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereft of both of you in one day? Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I loathe my life because of the Hittite women. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women like these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to me? Well, brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be indeed. You may be seated. What a passage. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and seek His help. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, and we, as I said on the front end of reading that, Lord, this passage is a messy passage. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear your goodness and the message of the gospel out of such brokenness, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. No doubt you've heard the phrase before, there is no such thing as a perfect church. Well, the same thing is true with families. Many of us come to church on Sunday and we are dressed in our best and we are on our best behavior in front of everybody else and it is very easy to fool those around you into thinking that you have the perfect family that has it all together. And yet all of us know deep down that there really is no such thing as a perfect family. Every family has its messes. Every family has its struggles, its troubles. Every family has... Um, you know, that one weird uncle that everybody, you know, is afraid to talk to on holidays because they never know what he's going to say, and so on and so forth. Everyone has their mess. And that is exactly what we see in this passage this morning. We see a mess. We see a broken family, a family that has struggles that maybe our family doesn't have, and yet many of us can relate to some of these people in one way or another. But what's the main problem in this passage? Well, the main problem is very simple, and you can see it in the title of the message. The danger of securing God's promises by human means. That is the problem of this particular passage. And that leads us to understanding what the main idea is. And if you're visiting with us this morning, you'll see that right at the end of the liturgy, we print the sermon idea in the bulletin for you to see 
follow along with. And the main idea this morning is this. When we try to secure God's promises for ourselves, we are often blind to our own true spiritual condition, leading us to employ sinful means with the best of intentions, resulting in disastrous consequences. What a statement. And yet here it is. Let's dive into this passage. Our first point this morning is God's promises and what I'm saying, calling spiritual blindness in verses 1 through 4. In fact, take a look with me again at verses 1 through 4. It kind of lays out the setting of this particular passage that gets everything in motion thereafter. In verse 1, when Isaac was old, his eyes were dim so that he could not see. He called his old Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, and he answered him, Here I am. He said, Behold, I'm old. I do not know the day of my death. Now therefore take your weapons, your quiver, your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me. And prepare for me delicious food such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now you can look at this and you can see that the intention is the blessing of the blind. Isaac being a man who is nearly blind. In fact, if you look very carefully, it doesn't exactly say that he's blind. It says that he is, you know, his eyes are dim. But what is, he, what is he looking to do here? The, the, the passage here in its setting focuses on Isaac's job as an old man who does not know the day of his death. And because he doesn't know the day of his death, he has to kind of set things in motion now so that the day when he dies, the proper blessings pass and the inheritance passes to the one who it belongs to. In fact, If you want to liken this to something in the modern day and age, this is like Isaac setting up his will so that when he dies, he's the testator of the will, that when he dies, the inheritance will pass to the son of his choosing. That's what's going on here today. In fact, in the ancient Near East, it was common for men of means and men of stature, men of wealth, to do something like this. And in the ancient Near East, these kinds of wills, these testaments, were were always verbal in nature. They they were written later, but then they were verbal initially. Let me give you a few examples of what this looked like already that we've already seen. In Genesis chapter 9, verses 25 to 27, you remember Noah when he comes out of his drunken stupor. What does he do? He speaks to his three sons. Notice what he does first. He ends up cursing Canaan because of the sin of Ham, his father. But then he turns around and he blesses both Shem and Japheth. And then after he dies, everything he said came true. The Canaanites were put to forced labor. Shem became the heir of the covenant promise. You know, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. And then Abraham comes from Shem the one who receives God's covenant blessing. And then Japheth, the father of the Gentiles, later on in history, his descendants will share in the blessing through Shem's ultimate descendant. But notice what you have there. Noah giving this verbal proclamation that functions like a will, giving the spiritual inheritance of his children. We're going to see this again When we finally get there in Genesis 48, when Jacob is about to die, he calls for Joseph. If you remember the story, Joseph brings his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And what does Jacob do? He blesses Ephraim over Manasseh, the younger before the older. And then in Genesis 49, Jacob calls all of his sons together, all 12 of them, and he pronounces what will happen to them in the latter days. In other words, he's giving them their spiritual inheritance verbally. That is what Isaac intends to do here with Esau. And it's interesting that when he tells him, you know, go and, and, and make this meal, this meal was likely a covenantal meal. It was a meal of ceremony, a meal that is a rite in and of itself to signify the promises that were given. But notice there are some problems in this 
particular passage that we can detect with how Isaac wants to go about doing this. And verse 1 tells us very clearly, when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see, I'm going to go ahead and stop there really quick. Again, it doesn't say that he's out and out blind. Maybe he had cataracts or something or those of you who have gotten older know that your eyesight is not exactly what it was when it was when you were younger. Some of us, like me, were not as fortunate and our eyes went bad when we were young and that's just how it is. But to say that his eyes were dim doesn't exactly mean that he was blind, but I want to give you an example from the New Testament of what this was probably like. Do you remember in, in Mark chapter 8, Verses 22 through 26, Jesus heals the blind man. And then immediately after healing the blind man, he asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they give answers. They say, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, if you go back and you look at that blind man being healed, if you remember, Jesus kind of spit in his eyes and put his hands on him and, and, and touched him and then, you know, healed him. But it didn't, didn't catch right away. Something didn't work. And have you ever wondered why he had to do this and heal the blind man in stages? Because the first time he touched him, uh, how, do you, how is your sight now? And the guy's like, well, I, I, see, I see men, but they're like trees walking around. He couldn't see so clearly. So Jesus had to touch him again. And then he was healed fully and finally, where he could see everything perfectly. What was the point? Well, the point was this man going through stages of going from blind to having dim sight to seeing clearly was a picture of the disciples in the background getting more and more and more and more spiritual clarity as they spent more and more time with Christ. Well, you see the opposite thing happening here with Isaac. He is now um, not fully blind, but he is so dim of sight that he cannot see. And it's the implication, as many commentators have pointed out, is the dim sight was likely a picture of Isaac's spiritual vision, which was not very good. Which is surprising because he is supposed to be the heir of the covenant. He's the son of Abraham, the friend of God. And yet even Isaac did not have eyes to see spiritually, clearly, what God had intended in his redemptive program. That leads to the next two problems or warning signs that we see that build on Isaac's spiritual dim vision, his choice of Esau. Notice in verse 1 he calls Esau to himself, and in verse 4 he makes it very clear that the purpose of calling Esau was so that he can pass on the Abrahamic blessing to his oldest son. Now again, that would not surprise many people in the ancient Near East. The older son was supposed to get the, the double portion of the inheritance. It was the blessing and the birthright were his by virtue of his order of birth. So what's the problem here? Well, if you remember, go back to Genesis chapter 25, verse 23, when Rebekah was still pregnant with both of the twins in the womb and they were fighting with each other, God interprets that for her. He says, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you will be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. And how does he end that? The older will serve the younger. Hmm. No doubt Isaac knew this. And it only exacerbates his spiritual blindness, so to speak, because what he intends to do here is contrary to what God had already decided to do before the two sons were even born. Isaac's decision in his very intention is set against and opposed to the word of God that had been revealed to him and his wife. And we have to ask, well, what's the basis of this decision to do something contrary to God's word? Well, this even makes it even worse. When he tells him in verses 3 through 4, take your weapons, your quiver, your bow, go out to the field and hunt for game for me, and prepare for me delicious food, how does he say it? Such as I love. This points to the fact that Isaac prefers Jacob over Esau. Why? Because Esau gives him food. Esau feeds the flesh. 
Now, I know we can all laugh and, you know, chuckle when, you know, we, people make jokes and say, women, you know, the, the fastest way to a man's heart is his stomach. This is exactly true in this passage. Why? Because he's feeding the flesh of, of Isaac. In fact, we see that back in, again in chapter 25, verse 28. Isaac loved Esau. Why? Because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Isaac loves Esau because of what Isaac can get out of Esau that feeds, nourishes, and brings pleasure to the flesh through his stomach. Now, the second problem, this just gets worse and worse, by the way. The second problem here, when he comes to the basis of his choice, is that this meal is a covenantal meal, as I've already said. It's part of a ritual. It's part of a ceremony of passing the covenant blessing on as an inheritance. And, and it, it highlights and points to Isaac's problem of spiritual blindness because he cannot see that what he is doing is contrary to God's word because he seems blind to the true nature of his son Esau. Esau himself, as we've, we've seen before, a man of the flesh, a man of the world, a man who looks like a man's man. Esau is the kind of guy that people would look at and be like, that's a natural born leader. That's the kind of guy I'm going to follow. It's not the guy that God has chosen. So what are some of the causes and results of this spiritual blindness by way of application this morning? Well, the causes of spiritual blindness are the flesh, and they do lead to neglecting or outright disobedience of what God's Word tells us. Now, this, is, this idea of spiritual blindness, uh, blind, being blind to our own spiritual condition, is far too common for most of us than we often realize. As we saw, it was the flesh of Isaac, the desires of the flesh that seemed to rule him. But it's easy to look at him and say, you've got the problem, Isaac. What about you this morning? What about me? You may not be driven by the appetite of tasty game to disobey what you know God's Word says to you. But maybe for you, it's the pursuit of pleasure, entertainment, sex, Maybe it's the pursuit of wealth or power or worldly success and reputation that drives you to disobey God's word and cut corners here and there. Whatever it may be, the moment we put our concerns, the concerns of our own flesh above the faithful obedience of God and His Word, that's the moment that we find that we are spiritually blind to our true condition before God. And moreover, the moment that we think that we really don't have sins in our lives to repent of is the moment that we actually really are truly spiritually blind. You remember when Jesus heals the blind man in John chapter 9? Do you remember how that ends? It's a really interesting discussion between Jesus and the Pharisees, and the Pharisees end up asking Jesus a question, are we blind too? You know what Jesus says to them? I'm paraphrasing this, so don't look it up and then correct me later, but essentially what Jesus says is because you say that you have no sin, you are truly blind. But if you were really blind, you would see that you had sin. What a statement. And that's Isaac's problem. That's oftentimes our problem. And the blindness to our, spiritual, to, to our own spiritual condition can often lead, brothers and sisters, to being blind to the spiritual condition of our children. How about that? Dr. John Currid of Reformed Theological Seminary applies this to the blindness that parents can often have in our own day and age to the true nature and spiritual condition of their children. Listen to what he writes here. This comes right out of his commentary. Yet, when we look into our own hearts and see how we treat our own children, Isaac's blindness is not so difficult to understand. How often have we turned a blind eye to them being our children? Do we really know where they are spiritually? 
Do we know if they are the seed of the woman? Do we treat our children as if they can do no wrong? Wow. I remember when I was teaching high school, this, it's hard to say that this is almost 10 years ago now, so you know you're getting old. But uh, when I was a high school teacher, I remember I chaperoned a few mission trips to Costa Rica. Uh, with the kids. And we always did this from the first week of January, which always hard because I could never celebrate New Year's Eve because I had to go to bed early to get up at 3 a.m. to get to the school to get these kids to another country by late that morning. (laughs) And I remember the students were not allowed to have their cell phones with them while they were working during the day because while we would go on these trips, we would do service projects in a community and then usually run a VBS for the local kids and Remember one year we had this one 16-year-old girl on the, on the trip who was constantly on her phone. Uh, she didn't do much help, much to help the other students, and she spent a lot of her time complaining about how everybody was always doing it wrong. Boy, it was really getting on my nerves, and I'm the chaperone, but then you're the teacher, so you have to kind of be nice about things, right? And I remember one, one time, one of the other chaperones finally just got so sick of it and decided to take her phone away. So I thought it was a good thing to do. This girl needed to just get on the ball, start help, helping everybody out. And I don't know how she did it. I don't know, maybe she had another phone or something, and, but she ended up emailing her mom, who then called the phone, and then one of the chaperones picked it up, and I was the kind of running the show, so I, I had to take the call. And that mother reamed me out for 45 minutes telling me everything that her daughter said that we were doing wrong. Yes, 45 minutes. Can you imagine that? 45 minutes of not really saying anything. You're just listening and getting reamed out for 45 minutes straight. It took every ounce of my strength to bite my tongue until I could hold it no longer. I finally, after 45 minutes, had to cut this lady off and answer her point by point but some of the complaints were, were so ridiculous, like, you know, you guys are staying in this, this place that has bars on the windows, and that hurts my daughter's feelings. Why didn't you think of that? My daughter said that she saw one of the kids in the neighborhood wearing a, a t-shirt that had a Nike logo on it, and if, if these people can afford Nike logo t-shirts, they're not poor enough to deserve my daughter's help. Things like that. I thought, okay. How do you really respond to that? And I finally had to, to say to this mother, do you understand what, how your daughter's acting on this trip? And this mother would not admit that her daughter had a problem. And I thought to myself, well, this is why we're having a problem with the daughter. The problem's really with the mother. The mother is so blind to her own spiritual condition, she is blind to the way her kids really are and her kids really act. Now, that's an extreme example. But having seen, having been a high school teacher, you know, when I was a kid, and I remember when I did things wrong in school, and, and believe me, there, there were enough times, admittedly, where the teacher, the staff had to call my parents. Boy, I can tell you right now, I was usually present when the phone call came to my parents. My parents did not ask the staff person why they did something wrong. They hung up the phone, and they dealt with me. They knew I did something wrong. And in our day and age, we tend to flip that script, don't we? I can tell you how many times when I had to call home with a behavioral problem with a kid when I was a teacher, how many times I got put on the defensive and the parents holding me to account for what I'm doing wrong as a teacher rather than letting, dealing with their kids' issue. This is what this passage is driving at. Spiritual blindness can lead to all kinds of disastrous results. And and in our case, it's going to get worse. Because as we see in our our second point here, in verses 5 through 40, and believe me, I'm not going verse by verse. We're going to summarize, okay? (laughs) We don't have that kind of time. God's promises by means of lies and deceit is what happens in in those large chunk of verses, 5 through 40. And it's the second major issue that we see in this passage is that when we rely on our own good intentions instead of the promises of God, we make a mess of things. We may mean well. Our intentions may be right. And yet you can botch and make a big mess out of something God is doing 
in his redemptive purposes. Look at verses 5 through 13 in summary fashion. Rebecca's good intentions to secure the promises of God. Now, to summarize, she's listening. She hears what Isaac and, and Esau are talking about. She calls Jacob. She comes up with this really cunning idea that Jacob go take two young goats and she'll prepare the food that she knows uh, Isaac likes and she's going to put them in his hands. You go, you get the blessing. Now, anybody who is reading this passage, even a surface-level reading, makes you wonder, how could you go from being like madly in love with each other when you finally meet at the end of chapter 24 and you get married, to even years later when they're living in Gerar and even Abimelech sees them sporting together, and I'm not going to tell you what that means because you know what it means, to all of a sudden she's about to deceive her husband? Something's not right. I don't know what that is, but something is not right. Notice what she's doing. First, she's laying out a plan to deceive her husband. Okay, that's clear enough. Second, she's laying out a plan to undermine her oldest son, which she knows would crush him. Third, she's calling her youngest son to do something deceitful. Why would she do this? Why? Well, as I think about this, as I was preparing this this week to, to share this with you, I can only come up with one answer, and it, it, it really gives her the best benefit of the doubt, but doesn't really exonerate her. I believe it goes back to Genesis 25, 23, where God told her that Jacob would receive the covenantal blessing, the older will serve the younger. Putting this in the best light possible, what is she trying to do? She is clearly trying to be faithful to the Lord's promise. What's the problem? She is trying to accomplish those promises by her own cunning. She hears what Isaac is saying in his own spiritual blindness, and she decides to take matters into her own hands. In her mind, the ends justify the means. The ends of seeing God's promises fulfilled justifies the means, even if those means are sinful, deceitful, cunning, lying, so on and so forth. There's danger in that. The proper intentions, the wrong means, leads to verses 14 through 40. Jacob's lies, his deceit to secure God's promises. Now, this is where it just goes from bad to worse and gets really messy because where you can maybe look at Rebecca and say, okay, she had some good intentions in crafting this plan of lies and deceits. You cannot say the same thing for Jacob. He is just a lying, deceitful scoundrel in this passage. How do you possibly exonerate this man? Think about it. In verses 18 to 25, Jacob lies and deceives his own father, Isaac, when he knows his father is vulnerable, has dim sight, nearly blind. And because of that, Isaac, this is kind of interesting to me, Isaac kind of puts him through several tests, doesn't he? And you, some of you know this, like, if you know anyone who's, like, blind or has really bad eyesight, their other senses tend to be a little more heightened because once one sense is down, you've got to rely on the other four to get you by. That's what Isaac does here. Notice what he does. The first test, he tells Jacob to come near him. Why? In verses 21 through 22, that I might feel you. That I might feel you. He knows that Jacob was smooth. He knows that Esau was hairy. And so he wants to feel him. Now, the second test here in verse 22, he, he observes that even though he passed the feel test, something's wrong with the hearing. Okay, the hands are hairy. What's the problem? The hands are Esau's. The voice is Jacob's. <laughs> Are you really my son? He lies to him. Not only does he deceive him with the skins, now he's just out and out verbally lying to him. Yes, I am. I am Esau. The third and fourth senses are tested when Jacob 
He tells Jacob to bring the food, and no doubt he can smell the food. You know, the other night on Halloween, <laughs> kids were coming, coming around. My goodness, I ran out of candy so quick on Halloween in my neighborhood. Well, there was one day, I, one, one instance where I opened the door, and I happened to be cooking dinner. I was making a soup, and uh, oh, delicious chicken rice soup. And the thing was boiling in the, the pot. And I opened the door, and one kid, he was standing close to the door. He's like, oh. I thought, well, that's not good. He's like, are you cooking dinner in there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's like, I'll trade you the candy for the dinner. <laughs> no. <laughs> Take the candy, get out of here. There's no doubt, when he came in, he could smell that food. You can imagine his senses, you know, again, his senses are heightened. His mouth is probably watering. Okay, bring it, bring it here. He tastes it, he eats it, and what does he do? Gives Jacob the blessing. That was enough. He passed the, he passed the sense tests in his lies and in his deceit. And sadly, as Jacob did all of this, he both lied to his father outright in what he said. He deceived him with the goat skins and the food. And remember what this meal signified. This meal signified a covenantal meal attached to covenantal promises, attached to God's name and God's integrity. Wow. That's a lot of sin. And so he receives the blessings in verses 26 to 29. Now... Again, notice the blessings come after the meal. Uh, there's thing, things in this blessing that will parallel everything God has already said to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. First, notice what he says. See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. Okay, I'm not going to lie. When I hear that, I just think of, you ever like, get the scent of freshly mown grass? Like, oh, it's a lovely smell. May God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Wow. Notice he intermixes the divine name Yahweh with the generic term for God. He talks about the dew of heaven. In other words, what's the blessing here? The blessing is he's giving him the land of Canaan, right? The land flowing with milk and honey. This is exactly what God said to Abraham and Genesis 12, 1, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. So that's the first part. The second part, let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Hmm. This isn't just in the family. The mention of nations makes this international. This is global in its scope. And the fact that he says, when God says, you know, they will serve you, they will bow down to you, the word for you in the original Hebrew is a masculine singular pointing to this is an individual who will fulfill all of these. And again, it points to Genesis 12 too. The second thing God told Abraham, I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. That's to do with dominion. Thirdly, this is interesting. Isaac says, Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. Hmm. Again, that's roughly the same thing God said, only in reverse. In Genesis 12, 3, here he puts cursing first, blessing second. God does the opposite in Genesis 12. He says, um, And those who bless you, I will bless, and those who curse you, I will curse. But that's the threefold blessing that, that God, via Isaac, gives to Jacob. And what is fascinating to me here is you have a sinner receiving a blessing here he doesn't deserve. <laughs> that's really what's going on. So what about Esau? Well, if you fast forward and you go to verses 39 and 40, you see the, the uh, if you can even call it a blessing, it's really kind of a so-called blessing, which is no real blessing, which Isaac gives to Esau. And again, it's got three contrasting ideas. It's the three contrasts to what he just said to Jacob. 
And, then, and very quickly, in verse 39, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall be your dwelling, and away from the dew of heaven on high. I mean, that's the opposite of the lush, fertile land of Canaan that was green and fruitful and had, had water. In fact, if you know anything about the history of the Old Testament, you know that the geographical region that became Edom, southwest of the Dead Sea, is an incredibly arid, incredibly dry, and generally fruitless, barren land full of rocky crags and rough terrain. Secondly, Isaac says in the first part of verse 40, by your sword you shall live and you shall serve your brother. That's the dominion part in reverse, right? He said, you will serve, your, your brothers will serve you, Jacob. Well, Esau, you will serve your brother. He will have dominion over you. The older will serve the younger, as God once said, Genesis 25. And thirdly, he says, but when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now, I'm not going to go into all the times you see that happen throughout the Old Testament. It was many. Edom was constantly brought under the dominion of Israel and the, and the king of Israel, the sons of David. And there came a point where you will break his yoke from your neck. In other words, the place of blessing is under your brother. You will take yourself out of that and put yourself in a place of cursing is what's essentially going to happen. Wow, after all that, you have to ask, how does Jacob's deceit and subsequent blessing point us to the hope of the gospel in Jesus Christ? Well, the deceit is the result of trying to secure God's promises by the arm of the flesh, even when man but even when man intends for evil, God uses it for good. I am not going to stand here and try to, to somehow morally finagle and excuse Jacob's behavior and Rebecca's behavior. You can't. That's what makes this passage so messy to deal with. And yet notice how for messy people, for sinful people, God still shows mercy. He gives them a promise that they don't deserve. And look at the substance of that promise. I want to focus on one part of that promise. It's the last part of Jacob's blessing. Those who curse you will be cursed, and those who bless you will be blessed. Now, I already mentioned that that, that comes from Genesis 12, 3. But Genesis 12, 3 says something after that that Isaac doesn't mention. God tells Abraham, he says, and in your seed or in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. God reiterates that in Genesis 22, 18, when Isaac is nearly, um, I was going to say circumcised, I meant sacrificed, um, and God says, in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be what? Blessed. What's the point? Well, the Apostle Paul picks this up in Galatians 3.15, which Jared preached on, I think, two weeks ago. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. Notice what Paul says here. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring, who is Christ. Hmm. This whole promise that Jacob gets, the blessing, as he gets it as a sinful man who doesn't deserve it, points him to the one who will save him from what he has just done in his sin. Maybe this morning you are sitting here like Jacob and you have tried to secure the promises and the blessings of God by your own good works. Think about how most of us tend to think. Every one of us in this room has at least one, probably more, besetting sins in your life. Some of those sins, like Isaac, you are blind to. Some of them that you know about, maybe you fall into the trap of thinking, if only I'm good enough. If only I could shake this besetting sin of mine that's rooted deeply in my character, like Jacob's was rooted in his, then God would accept me, that God would love me, then God would save me, and that God would bless me. Maybe that's how you fall into thinking. I'll be honest with you, in my weaker moments, sometimes I fall into that kind of thinking. But the gospel shines forth in our passage this morning because if even a scoundrel like Jacob who did not deserve the blessing of God's grace, 
that would come in Christ, even if he could receive that, how about us? If, you've, if you're sitting here this morning and you have relied on your own means to receive the blessing, the call in this passage implicitly is a call to repent, a call to believe that God has sent his son to do and accomplish what you and I cannot do in the flesh. And what is more is that the blessing of forgiveness of sins, the blessing of eternal life, are to be received by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And I use those Reformation terms because we just celebrated Reformation Sunday last week. Right? That's what this is all about. And what's really fascinating to me, we're going to come to the table of the Lord's Supper here in just a few minutes. That is a covenantal meal, just like the one we see in the passage. But it is a covenantal meal that is actually enacted not on deceit, not on lies, but on the truth of fulfilled promises. How about that? That leads us to our last point in verses 41 to 46. That's a much shorter point, isn't it? God's promises in the face of disastrous consequences. Oh, this is where... It hits the fan, brothers and sisters. In verses 41 to 42, we see the broken relationship between Jacob and Esau, and you can imagine why. Verse 41, now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching, then I will kill my brother Jacob. That word for hatred is not just like this emotional, like visceral reaction, although it includes emotions. It's, it can be translated such as he harbored animosity, he bore a grudge. This is something he's going over and over and over and over and over again in his mind. And let's face it, when we're angry with someone and we go over things and we rehearse it over and over again in our mind, we are deceived because it gets worse and worse and worse in our own mind. And in this case, it's possibly going to lead to murder which is really sad because the last time we saw a brother killing another brother was back in Genesis 4 with Cain and Abel. But what Esau's anger shows is that he and his descendants have indeed inherited the spiritual mantle of becoming the seed of the serpent. But it's not the only brokenness that's mentioned. Verses 43 to 45, the broken relationship between Jacob and the rest of his family Think about it. Rebecca has to come and tell him, go and flee to, to Haran. Go to my brother Laban. Now, now she's, she's had that relationship with Jacob broken, the son that she loves. And what's really fascinating is when she says the statement, why should I be bereft of both of you in one day? There's an implicit assumption there about her relationship with Esau. Esau must have known that his mother was involved with this. She assumes in that statement that her relationship with Esau is already broken. Now Jacob has to leave. But she doesn't want either one to die. There's brokenness there. And there's further brokenness in verse 46. The broken relationship between Esau's wives and his parents. Now that, that really shouldn't be terribly surprising to you. I don't know what year it was, but if I had to guess, probably 1960 or 1959, there was a song that came out by Ernie K. Rowe, Mother-in-Law. Some of you older folks would know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, I'm not going to sing it exactly, but I can tell you what the lyrics are. He's talking about his mother-in-law. Satan should be her name, mother-in-law. You know, she's always complaining and telling him about what he's doing wrong, mother-in-law. And he's just like, why can't you just leave and leave us alone? Kind of like what's going on here. It's a little stereotypical, but there is a spiritual reason why. Notice what she says. I loathe, this is Rebecca, by the way, She's saying this to Isaac. I loathe my life because of the Hittite women. We can go back to Genesis 26, verses 34 and 35. You find that Esau took two women from among the Canaanites. He didn't wait for his, unlike his father Isaac, he didn't wait for his father to find him a wife and a, cov you know, a covenant partner to bring covenant children into the world. He just took that initiative on his own. And she says, if Jacob marries one of the Hittite women like these, like her two daughters-in-law, one of the women of the land, what good? You can almost hear the despair here. What good will my life be to me? Hmm. 
Brokenness, brokenness, brokenness. Why? All because you have a family of each, peop- each one of these people taking the initiative to try to fulfill God's promises in their own way and doing things contrary to God's word and giving it the best face on it, doing it with the best of intentions. What are the consequences when we attempt to secure God's promises on our own? Well, in, by way of application in this passage, while the consequences could be many, this passage focuses on the broken relationships that we can leave behind us in the wake. There's the consequence of anger. I'm not going to say a whole lot about that. I think you all know that the, right, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God, the Apostle James in the New Testament. But then there's the consequence of broken relationships. Boy, when you try to fulfill God's promises under your own strength, what do you leave? You leave behind you a train wreck of relationships, people that feel used, people that feel mistreated, people that feel violated, people that feel abused, people that feel double-crossed, so on and so forth, people that feel used. But all of this, brothers and sisters, is meant to point us forward to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because what is the ultimate broken relationship? The ultimate broken relationship is the relationship that we have with the Lord because of our sin prior to coming to Christ. This is a call to faith. Now, coming to Christ doesn't mean that at the snap of the finger everything is all right, but Christ does give you the power. He fills you with the Holy Spirit to begin to see things redeemed. Now, as we move forward in this passage, in this series, we were going to see that Jacob is going to go from broken to broken to broken to broken to broken before the Lord finally breaks him and transforms his life. But you see the root and the seed of that here in his receiving the promise that points him forward to the hope of the gospel. Are you clinging to that hope this morning? I hope that you are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We are thankful for your word. We're thankful, Lord, that even you give promises to broken people, to sinful people such as us. Father, we are so grateful that we do not have to clean ourselves off. We don't have to to try to get it all right before we come to you and submit and surrender in faith to Jesus Christ, but we can do that, and we have the promise, Lord Jesus, from you, from your very mouth in John chapter 6, that, that I, all, of all who come to me, that the Father gives to me, I will cast none away who comes to me. Lord, we pray that you would help us to love you more because of that tremendous grace such as we find in our passage this morning. We ask this in Jesus' precious and holy and righteous name.